Welcome, Restoration. How are you? Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Wow. When I was asked to deliver the word from Mother's Day, I was like, man, shouldn't I be getting the one being served? Well, I got to work on Mother's Day. <laughs> I was in prayer yesterday and the Lord just spoke to me. He said, he said, it's an honor to serve. It's an honor to serve. It's an honor to serve the, the families of restoration. It's an honor to serve my husband. It's an honor to serve my children. It's an honor. It's an honor because you're putting someone else's needs before you. Mm-hmm. If, and he also told me for single people, if you're not willing to put somebody else's needs before your own, think twice about walking down the aisle. All right, we'll start with prayer. Father, you know I love you, and I know you love me. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Now be with me. Speak through me. Help it to penetrate. I thank you, Father. These are your words, not mine. I thank you, God, for what you've brought me through. I thank you, God, for where I am right now. And I thank you, God, for where we're going. I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So I get the opportunity to recognize and honor my bonus mom, Helen Alexander. Come on up. <laughs> if you all can stand real quick and honor her, especially my family. Oh. Oh, I love you. <laughs> And I'll talk a little bit about, so the whole, just to let you know, the whole message is about her, so <laughs> you'll learn a lot about her. No, <laughs> no but she married my father um, when I was 12 years old. And if you know anything about 12 years old, that's a, a pretty tricky time when a lot of things are changing and you're going through your teen years and you're going through a lot of changes. And so I wanted to, to recognize that and recognize her for helping to shape my future, so thank you. And I also want to pay honor, I have this other vase because I want to honor my mother, my biological mother, my mother, uh, Rhonda, who also helped to shape who I am. Amen. And I wanted her here with me today. So this is representing her. <laughs> awesome, uh, thank you. All right. <clears throat> My parents divorced when I was five, and I went to live with her for a few years before parental responsibility changed to my father, who, has, who helped to raise me. So I want to honor you too, even though it's not your day. <laughs> oh, goodness. So I love my biological mother, but not being raised by my mother, the person who birthed you, it, uh, I dealt with years of doubt and concerns about my own ability to be loving mother and caregiver. That coupled with years of infertility and trying every pill and procedure that we could afford in order to have a child uh, left me with scars. And I was deeply troubled and I was questioning God. I think I didn't know if I would ever be able to be a mother and if so, would I be a good one? I took comfort in the loving relationship I had with my stepdaughter, Lauren. Thank you, Samuel. <laughs> and the amazing and awesome woman I'm choosing to honor today through this message, Helen. Helen's taught me many things over the years, helping me to navigate teen years into early adulthood and then to full-blown adulting with my husband and kids. But it has been two things that she's taught me that has specifically helped me in my relationship with God. And I wanted to share this with you uh, because I hope that it'll help you on your faith journey. 
and we're all on a faith journey. The first thing I'll share that she taught me is to own your truth. Is anybody taking notes? <laughs> Look, here's the thing. Is I, I'm, not, I'm not a feel-good kind of, you know, let me just give you a message, right? I really want it to be impactful. I really want it to stay. I don't play with the things of God, so if anybody knows me. <laughs> I laugh a lot, but last time I delivered the message, they said, that's the longest time I've ever seen you not smile. <laughs> it was 45 minutes, too. So. Uh, so when she taught, our truth is our past and the present. First, owning your truth requires acknowledging and dealing with the past. For me, the fact that I was not raised by my mother left me with scars and brokenness that I didn't even know existed. Um, for a long time, I didn't understand the depth of self-doubt and low self-esteem that I walked in and carried as a result of what happened. I was in an encounter, an encounter weekend, what we have here, and we come here. Can you bring the water, please? Um, and it's, a, it's just 48, it used to be 48 hours um, in the presence of God, and they're highly spiritual times. They're times where you just get so much. Um, and we were all lined up here at the front, a whole, all ladies were lined up in the front, and Pastor Jeanette was walking down the aisle in a highly spiritual moment, and she was giving each of us names. And when she walked by me, she gave me the name mother. And I was like, I ain't got no kids. Like, how am I going to be a mother? And so then she walked on, and then she came back to me, and she said, queen mother. And I, I mean, I can't explain the amount of fear that rose up in me at that moment. You would think you'd be, oh, yeah, I'm queen mother, great. But because of that self-doubt and that self-esteem uh, challenges, it really scared the mess out of me. <laughs> Trying not to curse. <laughs> he's, not, he's not through with me yet. <laughs> All right. And it said, me, a mother, I felt totally and completely inadequate and undeserving. All of my fears, all of the pain, all came flooding to the surface that had been buried deep. And that is where the healing process began. The pain from the, the past could not be healed until I shined a light on it and acknowledged the truth of where I was. I had to own my truth. So this faith that we profess is designed to bring us smack dab in facing our truth. Not to hide from it. The best example I can come up with, and I didn't come up with it, I found it, um, in the Word was the instance with the woman at the well. And in John 4, 16, if you can bring that up on me. So I'll, I'll go back in just a second. She went to go get some water at the well in the middle of the day. She met Jesus there, and he explained how he had uh, rivers of living water, and that if she drank his water versus the water from the well, then she'd never thirst again, OK? Now, great story, but that wasn't what kind of stuck with me. What stuck with me was when he asked her, go, call your husband, and come back. Really? Like, what my husband got to do with this? <laughs> really? <laughs> and then he goes on. Go, ne go next. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. 
The fact is, you have five, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true, okay? So, he really could have said, here's the living water, here you go, here's the message, I'm the Messiah, let's go about our business, let's do what we need to do, right? No, no. <laughs> he brought up the fact of her dirty past and what she was in the midst of and all her business, she would have probably liked to have kept quiet. But Jesus chose to expose it. He didn't do it to shame her. He did it so that she could acknowledge the past, get healed of it, and move forward. Okay? He brings light to our darkest areas so that we can move beyond our past. From that interaction, she ended up going into the townspeople, facing those same people she'd been trying to avoid, and share her testimony. And many came out to see Jesus because of it. This is an example of dealing with the past. Now let's talk about the present, okay? By owning your truth, it also involves owning the current state of affairs. Don't pretend to be something you're not. Don't pretend to gloss over problems as if they don't exist. I used to believe in the saying, fake it till you make it. Everybody know that? All right. In some instances, that has proved good. Okay, right now I'm faking not being nervous, right? <laughs> but in some instances, it's not so good, right? Faking it till I make it, it um, as I explained to the ladies last week, I would stuff my emotions. It caused me not to address the problems that existed right there. I was so busy acting like I was happy in my marriage that I didn't address the problems that were staring me right in the face. And as a result, my marriage started to crumble. Okay. It got to the point where we were all about to call it quits when the truth finally came out. All of the hurts, pains, disappointments, lies, for years it had been so hard to be truthful and everything came out. And it was hard to be truthful with the person that was closest to me, my husband, ironically, right? But Jesus wants us to own our truth of what is currently going on in our lives. If you'll bring up Mark 5 and 1, we read about the story of the madman who was full of demons. All right, they, Jesus and the disciples, went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Yeah, Bible scholars, let me know. <laughs> when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Keep going. The man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Stop there, okay? So what that explains is that he not only tortured everybody around him, he tortured himself. And that's what we do oftentimes when we don't address our, our truth of what's going on. We're torturing ourselves and we torture everybody around us. So what Jesus did, if we jump down to verse 9, what's interesting about this story is Jesus asked him, what is your name? Now here's the thing. Jesus knew everything, right? He didn't have to ask him his name so that he can find out what his name was. He already knew that, okay? He asked him his name because he wanted the madman to identify and to speak his truth. He said, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. 
In the example at the woman at the well, he knew about her past. Jesus knew his name. It wasn't for Jesus, it was for the madman. The truth is he was dealing with many demons and he wanted to be healed. And that's the, what we deal with. A lot of times we know what's going on and we want to be healed, but we have to acknowledge. First step is to actually acknowledge what's going on. What are we dealing with? What demons are haunting and tormenting us? All right. There are many examples of, have, of Jesus having uh, the people he healed acknowledge something about their current state before granting them their healing. In Mark 5, 31, the woman with the issue of blood, he asked, who touched me in the crowded area? In verse 33, he says, when the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembled with fear, told him the whole truth, the whole truth, not the half truth, not the details we feel comfortable with sharing with other people, the whole truth. We are called to deal with our past so that it's not a stumbling block for us, and ultimately so that it could be used to help someone else. Come on in, grab a seat. After a woman at the well got healed, she went back and was able to, same, able to face the same people she had been avoiding, like I mentioned before. She went to the well in the middle of the day so that she did not face all of the other women, which it was common for the women to assemble at the well in the morning in the evening times. So she went in the middle of the day. Luckily for her, that day she met Jesus. But I can imagine after her interaction with Jesus and telling all of her testimony and all of her business, she didn't have a problem going back to the well in the morning and in the evening with everybody else. It's not a bad thing to be transparent to be truthful about what's going on, to share it. I thank you, God. We've got to do that for healing. Lastly, oh, I almost skipped this. For those of us mothers and fathers raising children, you will only be as effective as you are truthful with your children. You cannot build your relationship, especially into adulthood, on lies. You will never experience the depth of the relationship you desire. You must deal with your children in truth. Mm. Lastly, Proverbs 19 and 5, if you can bring that up, says, a false witness will not go unpunished. And this is the major part. And he who pours out lies will not go free. There's so many of us who want to be free. We want to experience freedom. But you can only do that by telling the truth, yes, ma'am. not faking it. We must own our truth. And owning our truth is not just acknowledging the truth of what's going on, but take responsibility for it. So it's not taking responsibility for what happens to you by other people. You can't control other people. But you can own your response to it. The world that you experience around you, you've created. Your thoughts, your actions, your interactions with other people is, be, is created by you. Okay? So when you, take, when you own your truth, you're taking responsibility. The second lesson, we are more than just the physical. We are spirit. Although we differ in some of our views, my mother understands and operates from a deep place, a place beyond just our physical bodies that we can experience with our senses. As a result of this example, it's not hard for me to connect with God on a spiritual level and operating with a play, from a place that's deeper than just the surface. She's taught us through her own example that there is a dimension beyond what we can see. 
As a result, it's easier for me to tap into my spirit and understand that all of who is Diana is not just lips, fingertips, and hips. <laughs> I love beauty, don't get me wrong, but don't let the inches fool you. It's beyond, it goes much beyond the surface. Amen. All right. <sighs> There's much more than our accomplishments, jobs, roles, titles. I used to be on, want to be on somebody's you know, 30 under 30 list, right? 40 under 40. You know, I wanted to be outwardly successful. I wanted to be physically recognizably different. Okay? Now I place more importance on my inner man and my spiritual life than what's on the outside. It controls everything about me, how I handle situations, how I interact with people, being able to walk in love, being able to deal with people in love, especially difficult people. If we can go to Ephesians 6 and 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers, of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We're not called to wrestle with people on a surfacey, shallow level. And that's what most of us do. We argue, we bicker, some, something somebody does gets underneath our skin, they look at you the wrong way, they say the wrong word, they don't acknowledge you when you think that they should. That's all surfacey. This explains that we are more than just the flesh. We are spirit. And the spiritual forces and spiritual realm is much more powerful than the flesh. You've got to see that person as more than just the person that's standing in front of you or the situation you're dealing with. They are a spiritual force. You are a spiritual force. The spirit is limitless. The spirit is where we commune with God. The spirit is bigger than our natural bodies. We can operate higher and deeper. The example that I wanted to kind of mention about this to illustrate this point is about a month ago, I was at a women's encounter put on at a, at, it was for younger women. And I, you know, they placed me at the table with older women. So there's 95% younger women, and then they, there's one, two tables with older women. So I'm like, but I love younger women. Like, I want to minister to them. But I just go with the flow. It's an honor to serve, right? It's an honor to serve. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 and I know why God put me at this table, because this lady, she was talking and sharing what was going on in her life. And it was at such a point where, you know, I started to feel compassion. I started, you know, I was like, man, you know, that's kind of, you know, what's going on? And I remember the second day, spoke, God spoke to me very clearly, and he said, she's operating too low. She's operating by what she can see in the interactions that are happening on the surface. But she's much more than that. He said that she is an eagle in the spirit. And he really showed me. He, it was kind of like David and Goliath. It was like David was her natural physical body and Goliath was her spirit man. Come on. He was huge. He was huge. And that's the way that we are. Our spirit man is so much bigger than our physical state. When, when people come up to pray, and I love the, the, the part of the, the service when we actually have people, prayer captains, and when I get an opportunity to pray for people, which is such an honor, majority of the time when I pray, I'm praying to their spirit. And I'm praying so that they can lift their eyes and start to look above and beyond what's happening okay. currently. It's about identity. It's about uh, those things that are in the spirit that are much bigger than just 
conflict with one another. I thank you. All right. When Jesus predicted his death in John 16, 5, if you can bring that up. I don't know if I even gave you that one, but he said that he's going to return to God. So he predicted his death. He said, and they were all distraught. They were like, ah, what are we going to do? You've been with us. What's going on? Like, you don't leave us. So then he says that he would send someone greater, the Holy Spirit, who he describes as the counselor, and that he would dwell inside of us. But walking by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of us requires us to have a relationship with God, okay? And this goes beyond just a Sunday experience. The Sunday experience is just, like I said, that's surfacy, but you're so much bigger than that. Yeah. A relationship goes much further than just the Sunday experience, okay? When people see me, I want them to see the love of God and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Not the fruit of the world, but the fruit of the Spirit, which is joy, self-control, love, all those things that are so much greater than asking a car, a job, a title. The word came to me one night, and I'm about to, you know, close. One night, and it was all I could do to type, my fingers going on my phone as fast as he gave it to me. And I thought it was appropriate at this time to share it with you. So it can hopefully give you an idea and an understanding of how huge and how wonderful the Holy Spirit is and how God is. It says, this is what I type word for word, the word of God is my anchor, not because of the instructions, but because it attempts to describe a vast and incomprehensible God and his love for me. And the more I try to study him, the more I realize how great and wonderful he is how I can't even begin to understand the depth of his love and how masterful his plan is. His spirit, this unending, all-powerful, incorruptible, all-knowing spirit dwells in me. And his spirit talks and communes with my spirit. When I feed my spirit with his spirit, my spirit man grows bigger. My spirit man sees farther. I'm able to come up to where he wants me to be in my understanding. I'm able to not get bogged down with the emotions I'm feeling. I can deal with offense. I can tame this tongue. I can interact with others in love and not cower or be afraid. I can let my yes be yes and my no be no. I can walk in power and boldness. I can love you. So don't shy away from walking in the spirit and operating in the spiritual realm. This is where you find God. I wrote this down and said, I love you, Mom. I love where he has brought you from, what he has brought you through, and what you have instilled in us. You are a blessing beyond measure. I recognize that I was a choice. that you fully understood that marrying my father also meant choosing me and my sisters. I thank you for choosing the rest of your life. I thank you for choosing to spend the rest of your life with me, to love me the same as your own three children. I was chosen, and today is my honor to honor you.
To all the mothers, the most difficult and challenging situations can be a setup for a great blessing. Stay in the fight, own your truth, and walk by the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.